Good afternoon, class. I'm going to record uh, the first of our lectures on primary, secondary uh, piping circuits and design principles here. I will be emailing out this document that I'm going to be talking from. I do not have a uh, PowerPoint uh, made up from this, so we'll just have to uh, make our way through this one the best we can. So at any rate, um, I will connect um, attach this rather to the email and so you can uh, listen to the uh, lecture and you can have the document to read uh, on your own. I'll also be sending a link to uh, some online uh, videos on YouTube that discuss uh, this uh, primary secondary uh, piping technique. So uh, again this is by Bell and Gossett primary secondary pumping application manual. And here we go. <clears throat> and I'll make this as big as possible here. Uh, let's see. There we go. We may, we'll work from there for a little bit. Okay, so uh, we have to establish the very basic principles here. And that's what this first uh, figure two diagram is all about. Uh, this uh, discussion provides a basic uh, ground rule for primary secondary systems. Fundamental circuit is shown in uh, figure two. And let me just read over this and then I'll discuss it with you a little bit. Uh, all primary secondary control methods are finally referenced to the use of a common pipe interconnect, interconnection between primary and secondary circuits. Common piping is <clears throat> defined as a length of pipe common to both primary and secondary circuit flow paths, uh, purposely designed to low pressure drop. So you see the primary in this case, we're showing that we're just pulling out of the primary pipe. Uh, so we take part of the flow, we would go up into the secondary. Uh, let's assume this is a heating circuit pull that down. Uh, we would go through some sort of a coil. This could be a baseboard heater under a window, whatever. So we dump some energy out of this. We come back and so this is going to be cooler and we dump it back into the primary flow which would reduce the uh, temperature uh, downstream of this particular coil. <clears throat> so uh, this is the simplest arrangement and this does get used sometimes but generally speaking uh, we'll have a supply and a return line. But for the, the, the concepts here, you don't have to, and this is the simplest way they can show it. Um, and so these connection points are very, very close together because uh, we want hydraulic isolation between the primary, this primary pipe and the secondary piping up here. Okay, and by, and, and by, by that, what we mean is that flow through the primary, if these two, lines are very close together and there is no pressure drop between these two points. You know, if this is a, a one foot pipe, there's virtually no pressure drop, then there is no pressure differential to force flow through the secondary. So just um, having flow in the primary will not induce flow in the secondary in general. And that's where we get this term hydraulic isolation. So let's go ahead and read this next paragraph. Um, the common piping length is quite short and can vary uh, as between a close nipple uh, to and to an approximate uh, maximum length of two feet. So the longest you're gonna see this common pipe is two feet. And in general, it's gonna be just as short as possible. This provides for a minimum, a minimum of pressure drop in this piping length and ensures hydraulic isolation of the secondary circuit from the primary circuit. So flow in the primary circuit will not cause flow in the secondary circuit because of low pressure drop in the common pipe. So this is very short, no delta P across it. So just because we get flow here doesn't mean we get any flow in the secondary. You know, important fundamental concept. So you gotta get this down. Uh, the secondary circuit pump is used to establish secondary circuit flow. So this pump is illustrated in three. So what we do is 
we simply put a pump into the secondary. And so when we need to supply hot water to this coil, this secondary pump runs and it will pull whatever flow rate it's designed for out of this primary pipe, push it through the coil and has enough uh, pressure to get it back into the common pipe. And so then uh, this flow mixes with whatever's uh, still in the primary piping and adjusts the temperature and goes on downstream. Uh, the secondary circuit pump is sized to provide design flow rate through the secondary circuit with reference to the secondary circuit pressure drop only. Uh, in the sketch shown in figure three, this includes the pressure drops of A to B. So that would be on the secondary pump. Uh, B to C, which would be any frictional drops, any pressure drops in these lines would have to be supplied by the secondary pump. Uh, C to D, D to E, uh, E to G, uh, G to H, and H to I. So all of that. Uh, the common pipe uh, is, so this is set up to have virtually no pressure drop across it. So, you know, you can include it or not. It wouldn't matter. It's so small, it's not going to change anything. Uh, <clears throat> so since the common pipe uh, pressure drop AI is slight, it will have no effect on secondary circuit pumping requirements and the secondary circuit can be considered separately and in hydraulic isolation from the primary circuit. So that's what this is all about. Uh, let's make this just a little bit smaller here and maybe we can there we go. Uh, in primary and secondary application, the primary and secondary circuits are treated separately. And that's one of the big positive benefits of this. You could have one group of engineers working on your primary piping and a separate designing all of your secondary circuits. And they don't really need each other very much. It's, uh, they're, they're pretty much uh, separate design uh, issues. A sec a secondary circuit uh, pump heads have no effect on the primary circuit pumping head requirements and vice versa. So this singular fact permits design <coughs> of the large system as though it were a number of small systems. The function of the primary circuit simply becomes one of heat conveyance to or from the secondary while the secondary circuit serves the terminal heat transfer units. So this would be, this could be an air handler, this could be just any sort of a coil. Uh, and if we're thinking a heating application, so we would get hot water up in here, would actually deliver the heat to the conditioned space, and then the return water comes back, goes back into the primary. Okay, since uh, secondary circuits are energy head isolated from the large primary pumps, the control problem in the secondary circuit is minimized. Pressure ratio increases across control valves, et cetera, can be set low because secondary pump heads are low. In effect, control isolation is achieved with a remarkable decrease in operating problem. So for example, uh, let's say that you were designing the system and you wanted the pressure in this primary pipe to be what forced the flow through this circuit back into some return. Well, if this is a, this could be a huge pump that's pumping like at tech, it's pumping all over campus and it needs lots of pressure. Well, so if that pressure um, drop from this primary is what's driving flow through here, then that's gonna make any control valves up here have to see a much larger head to operate against. In a primary secondary arrangement, the control head that control valves in this secondary operating against is just provided by the secondary pump, which is a small, you know, almost insignificant pump compared to your large distribution pumps. So that's what that comment is referring to. Okay, so that works out pretty well. Okay, um, the simple design procedures that will follow 
uh, rules and definitions will establish other design advantages. And some of these other advantages are listed here. Uh, the first one is to design deep primary circuit temperature drops with corresponding reductions in primary pump and pipe size. So what we're gonna see is that for your, your primary uh, loop, you may well have, you could have 200, 250 degree water that you're supplying out, say underground to all of your buildings. Now you wouldn't wanna put 250 degree water into your uh, terminal units, but primary, secondary, as we'll see, can adjust that water temperature for each secondary and uh, drop it back to say 180, 160, whatever, and you can even do a reset on that. And so um, you can have a huge delta T, say you send it out at 250 on your primary, you might return it at 180. Well, that would be a 60 degree delta T. And so to transfer all of the heat that you need with that big delta T, you don't need as much flow rate and uh, you can use smaller pipe size. And so that's what this uh, uh, point number one is referring to. Uh, deep primary circuit temperature drops with corresponding re reductions in primary pump and pipe size. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about this as we get through this document. It's going to take uh, probably a couple of weeks to get through this thing. Uh, simple effective control methods uh, in the equipment room, boiler or boiler and chiller applications. Uh, this can have to do with changeover systems if we have a two pipe system etc. But we'll be talking about uh, this in further lectures. Uh, outside air handling coil design methods for freeze protection. Anytime we've got an air handler or a coil in the system that can see outside air and we've got the potential for freeze, we have to provide freeze protection for that coil. And primary or secondary uh, gives us some, some really easy, straightforward uh, ways to do that. <clears throat> uh, for application to heat cool zone switchover, uh, again, that's for a two pipe system. So we'll, we'll be going through all of these things in depth and detail. So let's look at primary and secondary rules and definitions. So here we go. Uh, you might want to jot some of these down on a piece of paper to make them easier to uh, remember. Uh, let's see, location of secondary circuit pump. Secondary circuit pump should always discharge into the secondary circuit. Okay, so the way this works out, your point of no pressure change, so you don't have a compression tank in this uh, secondary circuit, but this connection to this pipe and this, okay, so something else we picked up here in this diagram, this would be your supply main on this side, and this is showing a return main on this side, and this pipe that connects these two are called, is called a crossover pipe. So the crossover uh, connects the uh, supply to the return, and then your secondary circuit and your common pipe is the connection of your secondary uh, circuit to the crossover pipe. So we're showing a common pipe right here. This is in the crossover bridge and this would be the supply and this would be the return. And we have balancing valves on the crossover bridge so that we can adjust whatever primary flow we get uh, between this supply and this return. Okay, but as far as the pump, so this becomes the point of no pressure change. And remember, we want that on the suction side of the pump. So we want the pump as close as we can get it to this line connecting your supply line connecting to the crossover, which is gonna supply the hot water that gets pumped through the circuit. Uh, these little jobs, these little Zs are check valves. Uh, as we'll see, and especially in hot water systems, we can get some thermal um, uh, recirculation. This water, we can just get some transient recirculation and we can uh, dump heat back down into here. And so these are to prevent that, they call it gravity recirculation flows. Uh, and, but, but anyway, that's, these are just check valves. Uh, so uh, this would be the point of no pressure change down here in the what, whatever you have in the crossover bridge. And so we would have a small drop 
as we come down here on the suction side across the check valve into the pump. And then the pump would cause a positive increase in pump head. And then that would be the increase in pressure that was used to circulate the flow through the secondary and get it back into the crossover bridge. Okay, so this pump would be sized for the pressure drop from this point uh, through your suction side um, into the pump and then on the other side of the pump, all of the friction losses through the pipes, uh, the elbows, bends, anything that's in here, the coil, uh, all the way back around this uh, check valve and back into the common piping. Uh, let's see here. So now his comment, common piping can be considered as the compression tank, uh, no pressure change point. Uh, it is consequently generally wrong to pump into the common pipe, which means we don't want the pump on the other side. Um, common piping from the secondary circuit because of the decrease in secondary circuit static pressure. So if we, and we got a picture of it, this is wrong. We don't want to do this wrong. So then uh, if this is your point of no pressure change, you'd have a little drop here, but then this would have to drive that pressure down and we've already talked about this kind of, of, of an effect previously. So you don't want to do this. There's one or two examples towards the end of this where they suggest this, but not, not hardly very often. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's talk about the crossover bridge. I've already kind of defined it for you. Uh, <coughs> here's uh, Bell and Gossett's uh, definition. Crossover bridge is the cross connection between the primary supply main and primary return. Uh, it provides primary design, uh, primary design flow rate uh, to the common piping. The bridge contains balancing valves that and may contain a flow indicator uh, as, as some sort of a flow meter. Um, it is quite often underslung to simplify initial air venting. So this would be underslung, and this would be uh, overhead or overslung, I guess you could say. So if it comes vertically upward, it's an overhead crossover, and this would be an underslung crossover. Okay, uh, crossover bridge uh, overhead. While the underslung bridge is generally preferred, overhead crossover bridges are also employed. You can use either. The overhead uh, bridge cannot become airbound and will continuously purge air providing the piping pressure drop from the primary supply main to the primary return main, this delta P from here across here, uh, expressed in feet of water is greater than the height H. So the elevation that we come up before we go across on the crossover bridge. So this delta P has to be greater than H and this both expressed in feet. Uh, this is the usual case. Should H become greater than the estimated delta P or when uh, downfed secondary circuits are used from an overhead crossover, a manual air vent should be employed. So if you violate this, then what you can do is you can just put a manual air vent to allow when starting, because what, what happens primarily it's on startup, we get air bubbles um, can occur in this uh, supply main and be transferred up into this pipe and if you don't, if you see, if this is going down, you may not have enough velocity. You may not be able to get this air to come down uh, and, and flow through the secondary circuits and pull it down here. It's gonna, it may accumulate up here. It could come out of the secondary and accumulate up here. But anyway, if you can't purge it, then this can become air bound and then you can't get the flow that you need. So you need the manual air vent to, uh, so that you can get the air out of it. Um, and again, our uh, two foot per second uh, velocity overhead crossover bridges should be designed to a minimum velocity 
on the order of two feet per second in order to drive any accumulated air down the crossover return and into the primary return main. So if we have enough velocity, we can drive this stuff down. Get it in the return main, goes back to the air separator and gets pulled down in the system. That's what we would like to have happen. Okay, uh, the crossover bridge can be as long as necessary for inner connection between primary and secondary circuits. So it doesn't have to be this nice little balanced symmetrical thing that we show in most of these diagrams. You can come off of here and you can go way the heck down and you know, uh, then you can tap off here and come back. So they, they, they don't always have to look just you know, like this or like this or whatever. You can have all kinds of different shapes. Okay, uh, crossover bridge, uh, pipe sizing. <clears throat> uh, crossover bridge is generally pipe sized uh, to a piping friction loss rate ranging from, uh, and that M is milli inches per foot. I hate that. I just, just do one foot per 100 foot uh, up to approximately four foot per 100 foot. Uh, and to the required primary flow rate. Uh, when required primary flow rate is equal to secondary flow, which is typically what happens in a chill water system, the crossover bridge, uh, common piping, secondary piping sizes are equal. So, you know, whatever the flow, say if we're, we got 40 GPM, this is a big pipe with a lot of flow. We got 40 GPM coming down here, 40 GPM through here, 40 GPM going out, 40 GPM uh, coming back, and then 40 GPM coming up here. So, I mean, the flow rate's the same, so they would all be equal uh, sized, you know, whatever your frictional drop rate was you were designing to. <clears throat> but quite often, uh, primary flow rate will be considerably less than secondary flow. That's primarily in heating systems, where again, our primary water temperature may be very, very hot, to uh, minimize flow rates and pipe size on the primary. Uh, when the common piping uh, is a part of the crossover piping, special application procedure should be followed to prevent any possibility of jet flow through the common piping. So what they're talking about here is, so let's say this guy is really hot and let's see, what do we need? Um, yeah, this is 10, I couldn't find it. This is 10 GPM coming down through here. But this is going to be 40 going out to the secondary. Well, if I only got 10 here and I got 40 here, what happens? Well, this return flow is going to be 40. So 10 of it will go here and 30 of it will recirculate and it'll mix at this T and come out. So it's that 30 GPM mixing with this 10 GPM that tempers this really high temperature and then gives us the flow rate we need in the secondary. So what this is looking at is on the pipe sizing, you know, this could be, this could be a long run and with only 10 GPM, uh, inch and a quarter pipe would, uh, would be fine. But when we get up in the vicinity of this uh, uh, common pipe, and the uh, secondary uh, supply and return lines, they're all two inch. We want to go ahead and, and uh, increase that's one and a quarter up to two inch. And we're saying that we want to do it eight diameters upstream on the supply and four diameters downstream on the return. So that would be upsized. The common pipe would be two inch and all of this. So up from here, well, I guess from here to here, all through here and here is all size for the 40 GPM. Now from here to here, it's only carrying 10, but we want to get that two inch far enough upstream and downstream that we don't upset flow in the common pipe. So that's what that's about. Okay, so common piping length and flow characteristics. Common piping is designed for minimum pressure drop. We've said that it's short um, and we don't want any delta P uh, any more than we just have to have across it. 
and can vary in length from a short nipple uh, to approximately two feet. Common piping flow rate and direction characteristics will be established by the relationship between the primary and secondary flow rates. The three basic evaluations uh, that should be made. Uh, primary flow greater than secondary, primary flow equal to secondary, and primary flow less than secondary. And so we'll illustrate all of those. Okay, so this is pretty common sense stuff once you figure out what they're doing. So let's see, this is an illustration of primary flow greater than secondary flow. Okay, so primary flow is 150. So the secondary flow is 100. So I got 150 GPM coming up here. I've got 100 being pulled out of the T and the secondary. Guess what? I've got 50 GPM going on through the common pipe on towards the return. So then my 100 GPM gets pumped by the secondary pump through the secondary circuit. I got 100 GPM return, it comes into this T, it mixes with this 50 that uh, bypassed in the common pipe, then I've got 150 return, and it goes back into the return bank. So, pretty simple. And of course, they really beat this to death, so they blow up that first T, and you just, just shows that I got 150 in, and 100 going vertical, that leaves 50 going into the common pipe. So we already talked through that. Pretty straightforward. Okay, uh, that's more of the same. It just shows, you know, all of the common piping comes back together. Uh, it will be noted that secondary supply temperature must be equal to primary supply temperature so long as the primary flow is only slightly greater than the secondary flow. Well, most chill water systems are designed with a constant supply water temperature requirement. Primary supply water flow rate is consequently set slightly higher uh, than the secondary, and this ensures that we get, there's just a little trickle through the common pipe. Because, you know, if, if this was chill water, say 42 degrees, and we wound up pumping a little bit more here than here, that would require us to pull some return water and mix it, and then we would lose our 42 degree water. It would be 43, 44, 45, and that might affect our ability to cool and dehumidify the secondary. So uh, uh, the chill water system, um, if this is 150, uh, say maybe this one might be 145, and you would just let this be 5 GPM to bypass. Not much, just a little bit to make sure that this one doesn't turn out to be larger than this one, and we recirculate and lose some of our cold water temperature. Uh, let's see, should the secondary circuit pump be stopped and the common piping flow rate would immediately increase to 150 GPM and the entire primary flow would bypass the secondary. So yeah, so if, um, let's see, if this pump stops, then because there's basically no pressure drop, there's nothing to force flow through the secondary, then all this 150 would simply bypass and go from the supply uh, main to the return main. Okay. Uh, consideration B, primary crossover flow equals secondary flow. Well, so then we're gonna put 100 in here, it's all gonna go up here and you have no flow in the common pipe. So that's pretty simple. 100 GPM up here, 100 goes into the secondary. 100 around here, 100 back down into here, no flow in the common pipe. Uh, when the primary flow rate is set equal to the secondary, there'll be no flow rate in the common piping. Uh, secondary supply temperature, again, will be equal to primary supply temperature and return temperature will equal uh, primary return temperature. Uh, 
Uh, and the third situation is, uh, this is what we do on the heating side of thing. The third evaluation is for the condition where the primary flow rate is less than the secondary. The same circuits used previously, except that the primary uh, crossover flow is decreased to 50 while the secondary is uh, maintained at 100. And so I think you all are probably getting used to this by now. So if I, if I got 50 here and 100 here, guess what? I got to have 50 here. And so this is going to be return water and we're going to mix here. And so, you know, this, if this is really hot water and this is, you know, cooler water, then we'll moderate that temperature and actually goes to the secondary. So I think that's pretty straightforward. 50 GPM here. Uh, I draw 50 in from the return, kind of backwards through the common pipe. We mix here. We go out through the secondary. 100 GPM back here. 50 goes this way and 50 returns into the uh, primary return main. Okay, the most important characteristic of system design where secondary circuit flow rate is greater than primary is the mix occurring at TA. Common piping flow at a temperature equal to the secondary circuit return, that's after we've cooled it off, mixes with primary supply water to provide a mixed secondary supply temperature. This most important characteristic provides smooth reset controllability, establishes deep primary circuit temperature drop possibilities, and can be used to great advantage in the numerous primary secondary control arrangements made possible. And we'll be going through a bunch of these in depth and detail. Uh, a second important conclusion that can be drawn from figure one is that primary crossover return temperature must be equal to secondary return temperature. You know, so, you know, we got 100 GPM here, it's all the same temperature. It comes down through here and it splits. So this return temperature and this return temperature have to be the same because they came from the same flow. So, uh, in general, primary secondary design establishes that the primary crossover bridge flow rate will be equal to or less than the secondary flow. This means that primary crossover bridge return temperature for the full load design condition will always be equal to the secondary return. Uh, common piping flow characteristics, generalized control applications. Okay, so I'm gonna stop this right now and uh, we'll take this and maybe slightly smaller bites and uh, I'll do another one here and get it out to you soon. But you can go ahead and look at this and you might wanna go ahead and read over uh, this uh, uh, primary secondary document that I'm gonna send you out. So I hope you're having a good afternoon and I'll get this uh, posted to you uh, real soon. Bye for now.